Good morning. It's great to uh, hear all of these different languages and uh, kind of be able to celebrate um, with our Swahili brothers and sisters. So thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, as Pastor Jules mentioned, we started our membership class. It's good practice for when I do the the English congregation membership class. You guys are getting the very rusty version of, uh, of that. So uh, looking forward to next week as well. <clears throat> one, uh, one day, Kim might remember this because I came back and told her when she worked at the church, but one day I, I walked into a uh, Tim Hortons just a few months after living in Calgary and as I stood in this extremely long early morning lineup for coffee, uh, a group of individuals entered the restaurant. And uh, they stood in all these different spots uh, and they began to yell out loudly, repent from your sins, Jesus saves. And then they proceeded people to pray with them and that People should come and talk to them if they wanted to. And then they very triumphantly kind of left the building. Now, this isn't the first time that I've kind of had that encounter. They must wait for me to go into coffee shops to tell me to repent. I must carry a badge. But this was not the first time. Um, and I mean, I, I've, I've experienced it in other countries, but then also it's not my first time in Canada where you know, that people come into that space and announce to individuals that sin is a problem and that Jesus can be their solution. And each time in my Canadian context, each time this happens, people give the exact same response every single time. Um, they kind of look down, <laughs> they scroll their phones a little bit faster, they smirk, they roll their eyes, they sigh deeply kind of cuss under their breath, and everyone keeps walking to get their coffee. Now, for so many reasons, uh, people don't really respond well to this in Canadian culture. And while the intentions are good, the roots of such ac actions come from this idea that we must do everything we can, uh, not to help people grow an awareness of who Jesus is, but rather we must do everything we can to get people to heaven. Now, growing up this type of thinking, it was fairly prevalent. Sin was a grand narrative that kept God away from us, made God angry with me, and at times to dislike me or disown me. And if heaven was the goal, then sin was certainly the barrier. And to add to it all, I was Methodist, right? And so good free Methodist, we add to that doctrine of, we add to that the doctrine of perfection. And so that becomes this added burden as God at work in us included the pursuit of achieving perfection, which was equated as the pursuit to become sinless. You know, this little boy, every time he comes to church, completely steals the show, and I'm just, and I'm just in love with it. <laughs> it's so adorable. He's so, so, so cute. He's almost as cute as mine. I mean... <laughs> Maybe a slight margin, of, slight margin of difference, but he is quieter, much quieter than mine. And so this always kind of talks about this pursuit of perfection, this pursuit to become sinless. And for some, this sounded like good news, but in speaking with people who grew up with this, who are now adults, the reality is that oftentimes this, um, oftentimes this was simply anxiety-inducing news because sin remained, sin kept showing up, and all kinds of situations emerged that seemed a bit gray, to be sure. <coughs> and so yes, <clears throat> excuse me, and so yes, Jesus loves me, but it might not last. It might not last if I can't get my stuff together, if I'm not good enough, if I'm not holy enough, if I'm not perfect enough. In Romans 7, there's this well-known passage of scripture. I remember in Bible college way a long time ago. It was a really long time ago. It's like over 20 years now. So I remember in Bible college, like people used to, we were, we were so weird when you think about it. Going to Bible college is weird. Um, and the people who are there are weird because one of the things that they did is they would, 
um, like they would have competitions about memorizing this passage. Like who does that? No one. No one does that except for us. So they would, there was this people and they would, they would have these little competitions about memorizing this particular passage. Um, I will say they were all from America, the ones who did that and grew up with um, Bible quizzing. So they were practiced, they were well practiced in this work. But one of this, pa this passage that is well known says, I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the things that I hate, but I know that what I'm doing is wrong. This shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin in me that does it. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And it goes on and says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Now, some scholars kind of believe that this is Paul's description of Israel's relationship with the law. And if you go through the Old Testament, you'll see over and over again that Israel has this deep reverence for the law. They celebrate it. They talk about it. They go to the synagogue to learn about it. But it is the following of the law where it all falls apart. The following piece is where they fail time and time again, and the result would be that they find themselves in conflict with their neighbors, in conflict with themselves, in conflict with their nation, in conflict with their families, in conflict with their communities. And they too would wonder and ask questions that seem very similar to the questions that I would ask. And we see those questions in the Psalms, in the wisdom literature, in the prophets. God loves me, but it might not last if I can't get my stuff together, if I can't be good enough, if I can't be holy enough, if I can't be perfect enough. And Paul seems to suggest in Romans 6 through 8 that the biggest problem facing these people who call themselves the church, the dear ones who have walked into this deep awareness of who Jesus is, those who now have found their way to both recognize and experience the Holy Spirit as their guide, that their biggest problem isn't actually sin. Rather, their biggest problem seems to be their fear that Jesus isn't enough, that his grace is insufficient, and that the Holy Spirit isn't present. And Paul insists that the opposite is, is true. He says, Jesus is more than enough, grace is sufficient, and the Holy Spirit enables us and emboldens us despite the sin that surrounds us. And while the original listeners may wonder, how is he so confident, we, the modern readers, know more of the story. And that Paul is not speaking as one who is an outsider. Paul is not communicating simply out of theory, but Paul was once the model for what it looked like to be right with God. In Philippians 3, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. I became a teacher of the law, a Pharisee who demanded of myself and others the strictest following of the law. He says, I obeyed the law without fault. But where did that leave him? What did that produce? It produced a man who terrorized fellow Jews because they did not believe or follow his ideas or his ideals. He murdered people, he ran them from their communities and their homes, and he hunted them down with righteous anger. All of it because he believed that was the way to be made right with God and to remain in good standing with God. He followed the letter of the law. Yet on that famed road to Damascus, as Paul is traveling to continue his law-abiding mission of wiping out those with whom he theologically disagrees, disagrees with, he has this spiritual encounter where he meets Jesus. And he sees Jesus in um, what we might call a vision. And Jesus asks him this question, why are you persecuting me? And everything changes in this moment, not because Paul becomes better at following the law, but because his encounter with Jesus grows his awareness of Jesus, which compels him to move in a new direction. And we are reminded that if the law was going to keep anyone from sin, it was Paul. And then we are further reminded if the rules are going to keep anyone from sin, it's the church. But Paul reminds the Romans and us that the reason sin is powerless is not because of our ability to disarm it. It is not based on our capacity to do more or become better or to be pious. But Paul says, 
when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of grace. Yancey says this about grace. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a powerful statement. Yancey says this about grace. He says, grace means there's nothing I can do to make God love me more, nothing I can do to make God love me less. It means that I, even I who deserve the opposite, am invited to take my place at the table in God's family. Invited, welcomed, made a part of all things. That is what grace produces. Now, grace is a word that we are far too judicious with. We're always scared to use it. We are so terrified of offering too much grace. You hear people talk about that. You know, know, those those people over at West Springs are just so, talk about grace and love a little too much. Where's the hammer? We're afraid of accepting it too much. We're We're afraid of needing it day in and day out. Yeah, there we are, synonymous with Israel and wondering, how do we break free from the trap of not doing what we want to do and instead doing the very things we hate? And Paul's response in chapter 7 is this, thank God the answer is found in Jesus. And before anyone has the opportunity to add a caveat or an addendum or a footnote to what Paul actually means, he goes on in chapter 8 verse 1, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. We no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. And if you find your way to the very end of chapter 8, you come to see this beautiful pronouncement is coupled with these words, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. These are powerful and sometimes frightening words because they call the church to acknowledge that in Romans 8, we are not invited to do anything. Rather, we are offered a description of this all-encompassing transformation that God gives through the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. It is a declaration of all things being made new, including me and including you, not because of the absence of sin, but because of the work of Christ. So sin can destroy you, and it can destroy those around you. The rules can destroy you, and it can destroy those around you. Thanks be to God that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and his grace is more than sufficient for where we have been, for where we are, and for where we will find ourselves. N.T. Wright paraphrases Romans 8 like this. He says, who is against us? No one. God, after all, has given us his son and will give us all things through him. Who will bring a charge against us? No one. God himself has justified us, has declared us to be in the right. Who will condemn us? No one. Jesus has died, been raised and exalted and intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? No one. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in King Jesus. If I felt that those um, surprise public pronouncements uh, about God in Tim Hortons were effective in our culture for people to grow in their awareness of Jesus, this is the message that I would hope the church would be shouting out with abandon. This message of love, of grace, and of forgiveness. It is very much the message that Jesus repeated and lived and offered time and time again. We see it in the parable of the prodigal son, in the story of the woman caught in adultery, in the story of of the woman who comes and finds herself at the feet of Jesus and washes his feet with her tears. We find it in the story of Zacchaeus, in the story of Levi, in the story of Peter, all the way till we realize it is also the story of us. All around us, there are people 
looking and listening and longing and praying for good news. And here we have it in the ever-present whisper of the gospel. Love remains and grace never fails. As we go from here today, I hope you have plenty of opportunities for the grace that we discussed today to not just be something that you receive and that you accept and that you experience from God, but it also is what you offer to the world around you. That you have moments where you offer grace to those you disagree with, grace to those who perhaps have harmed you or hurt you, grace to yourself, grace to your family. May this be a week that is filled with abundant grace. Have a blessed week.